Hi, welcome, and thanks for joining us for today's HIS Talk webinar, Inside Anthem, Dissecting the Breach. It's brought to you by HIS Talk. I'm Lori from HIS Talk, and I'll be moderating. The Anthem cybersecurity breach has been characterized as the largest breach in the history of healthcare, with over 80 million people affected. In this presentation, you'll go inside the latest intelligence related to this breach and learn about the tactics, techniques, and practices used by the attackers to successfully breach Anthem. Unlike some of our other webinars, this is meant to be very interactive with a lot of Q&A. We also welcome attendee thoughts on the topic along the way. I have a few housekeeping items to make you aware of before we get started. Attendee phone lines have been muted to prevent background noise. You can use GoToWebinar's questions box in the console to submit your questions to our presenter at any time. You can also use the chat function to send questions or comments to me at any time. The presenter will answer your questions during Q&A, which will follow his introduction of the topic. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you'll receive links to the recording, as well as a PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. Our speaker today is John Gomez. John is currently the CEO of Sensato, a cyber-based security and privacy healthcare company, Jago Labs, a product design and management consulting firm, and Group Espada, which provides counterterrorism services. Previously, Mr. Gomez was the Chief Technology Officer and Co-President of Allscripts. He was also the CTO of Eclipsis and WebMD and worked at Microsoft in various capacities. John will be presenting another webinar next week titled Cloud Computing Cybersecurity Considerations, which you can register for on HIS Talk. With that, I'll turn it over to you, John. Great. Thank you very, very much. Um, <clears throat> so I want to welcome everybody. I realize that um, this is a, a chunk out of your day and that everybody's got a lot of valuable things to do, so I'm hoping that I can make this as valuable for you as possible. Um, <clears throat> To get started, Lori gave you my background. Just want to touch real quick on kind of framing my perspective on this. Uh, Sensato is a cybersecurity firm um, focused solely on healthcare. Um, so what we do is is has nothing to do with any other industry. So we try to take a, a view of what is the impact in the healthcare arena. Jago Labs, although we do a lot of product design and development and management consulting, we've become more and more involved in cybersecurity research specifically in the area of cyber munitions. And so <clears throat> my hope is to kind of qualify the things you're going to hear. Um, what I will tell you is that we're not looking to pitch anything here uh, or to provide you with a commercial or a marketing event. Uh, this is really about you getting information that is hopefully uh, helpful to you as you plan your cybersecurity strategies um, and, and deal with um, the road ahead. So some quick objectives. Um, three of them. First of all is to kind of give you an understanding of the Anthem breach methodology. So how was the attack actually perpetrated? Who was involved? Uh, what, what occurred? With that, we want to try and dispel a lot of the myths. Uh, there's a lot of information in the media and other channels that, you know, some of it's real, some of it's not so real, um, and a lot of it's just off the mark. So hopefully through this uh, presentation, you'll gain a much, much deeper appreciation and understanding of fact from fiction. And lastly, we'll touch on some options for you to consider and take action upon uh, for your own organizations <clears throat> in light of the Anthem attack. You know, I've been asked several times in the past couple weeks, does this change anything? Does, does Anthem, is Anthem a pivotal point for cybersecurity and healthcare? And I hope it is. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty large attack, and many of us know the numbers, but we'll touch on those in a little bit. But I really do hope that we don't need another large attack to, um, to change behavior in terms of how we, as an industry, um, look at cybersecurity and privacy. So with all that, though, I want to give you a little bit of a disclaimer, and I want you to understand that everything being presented here um, you know, is something you need to evaluate and validate on your own. Um, you know, we're not trying to provide a consultative guidance to anyone. Uh, we're just sharing information. It's for educational purposes, <clears throat> and we just want you to be aware of that. Secondly, secondly disclaimer 2.0 kind of thing, is that, um, you know, this is an ongoing criminal investigation. 
And so if there's any information, especially if you ask a question during the Q&A, which I hope you will, but if there is a question that, in my estimate, would compromise the investigation or provide information that could compromise our industry, then I'll probably decl uh, decline answering that question. Um, but I just also want to keep, want to also highlight that since this is an ongoing criminal investigation, you have to be aware of the fact that not everything that occurred with this breach is out in the public domain. Um, when we saw the Sony attacks occur, a lot of cybersecurity researchers and, and, and uh, scientists rushed to speculate on the, um, the origin of the attack and discount some things, but it's very important to understand no one had and still does not have all of the information related to Sony. There are some differences in terms of the attribution that we um, have for the uh, Anthem attack, which you'll see in a moment, but again, it's an ongoing criminal investigation, and no one source is going to have access to all the information except for the investigators from the Department of Justice. The information in this presentation is current as of a few hours ago, um, so it's the latest that we have, but it's a snapshot in time. And as more details and more intelligence comes to light, then uh, obviously this could change, become dated. But I think that overall our reaction and the guidance on responses and options will pretty much remain the same regardless of how the evidence evolves. So just um, <clears throat> this, the audience here is probably very broad. We have people from a variety of different backgrounds, vendor community, uh, providers, payers, uh, investment bankers. And my hope is to make sure that the presentation speaks and resonates to each one of you from your individual perspective. So I want to make sure that we cover a few terms that I'm going to be using. And secondly, um, let you know if there's something that you were hoping we were going to go deeper into or something that you didn't quite understand, feel free to reach out to me and I'll do my best to, um, to help and, and either go deeper with you or, <clears throat> or help you understand what, what may have been a little too technical if we get to that point. In terms of the terms, one thing is an attack surface. Um, the attack surface is, from a hacker's perspective, any computing device that they feel they can get to. Um, so it's the entire landscape of what can be attacked is the simplest way to say it. <clears throat> the attack pivot, if we use that term or if you hear that term, simply means that I was able to compromise something in your environment and then I can use that to launch another attack and overall escalate my attack. So I'm able to go from a low value target to a very high value target. And then a phishing attack is simply tricking someone, typically through sending an email, a fake website, um, and getting them to act as they would if they weren't tricked, thereby gaining valuable intelligence. The bottom line here is <clears throat> that when it comes to Anthem and most attacks, all of these things are in play, and they're just good things for you to know, regardless of what perspective you're viewing this presentation from. So a little bit about Anthem. <clears throat> I know we all know probably who they are and what they do, but I think it's really important as we look at the evidence and dissect this breach that you keep some things in mind. First of all, they insure very small to very large businesses. They do state-sponsored insurance programs. They support the Medicare programs. And really important, which we'll come back to later, they uh, insure and provide insurance for federal employees as well as federal contractors. Um, so it's a key thing for you to file away for right now, and you'll see why that's important in a little bit. I also want to be really clear that there's no current evidence, at least that I've seen, what I've heard of that suggests that Anthem was negligent <clears throat> or a weak target. And I think that's critical to, to point out because, um, you know, we often kind of jump to conclusions that, well, they didn't do this or they didn't do that. And frankly, you know, the reality of that is something called the rationalization response syndrome, which I'm not going to go too deep into here, but it's we, we try to rationalize these attacks. And if we can find holes in somebody else's security or process or procedures, kind of makes us feel better. The reality of life is that Anthem wasn't really all that soft a target. At least at this point, we don't believe they were. It may come to light that there were some things they could have done better, but overall, um, there's nothing glaring at this point. And as an industry, I think it's important that we kind of, you know, embrace the fact of what happened to Anthem could have happened to probably anyone. It may very well be happening at this very moment. So let's talk a little bit about the breach. <clears throat> So first thing is the breach may have started as far back as April 2014 
we're going to spend a lot of time discussing that, that time period and what activities actually occurred that give us the belief that that's why uh, we're using that date. We do know that there were several attack vectors that were used and methods. Phishing is what you probably have heard about in the media, meaning that somebody uh, got an email or went to a website and because of that some malware was installed and that escalated attacks and attack pivots were used to then continue to escalate that attack and conquer the systems. We do believe that that is one of the ways that it was a uh, that they were uh, that Anthem was made vulnerable and attacked. But we also believe that there were other vulnerability exploitations um, that were used. So if you think about it, it's kind of like a one-two punch. Uh, the attackers didn't just rely on one technique, they used multiple techniques. And the last one is custom tools that the attackers used and developed. And we'll talk about each one of these and you'll see this picture come together as we continue to unfold the evidence in front of you. <clears throat> one of the things that they did do is data dripping. Some people call it leakage. I prefer to call it data dripping. If you think about a coffee maker and coffee dripping out of it comes out very slowly over a period of time. And that's one of the tactics that in a lot of these breaches you'll see over and over. When people say 80 million records were compromised, it wasn't like 80 million records were taken in a couple hours. Nobody walked off with an entire database. What occurred occurred over months and more than likely the attackers took a little bit of data here and a little bit of data there and over a period of time were able to take uh, what they set their targets on. <clears throat> they also could have spawned secondary attacks. One thing that causes a lot of challenges that we see in the industry is because attackers are very collaborative. Hackers work together really, really, really well. You know, if you have an attacker in the U um, a hacker in the U.S., another one in China, another one in Russia, they will collaborate. They will share tools, techniques, they will share intelligence, they will share information. And what happens is you start spawning secondary attacks on a target. With Sony we saw this, and a new term has been coined over the past 12 to 18 months, which is EAS or espionage as a service. And so, you know, we've attributed that attack to North Korea, but in the past several weeks we've started hearing and learning that there's a very strong possibility that Russian hackers uh, followed behind North Korea and set up what's called an EAS a kind of platform. Now just to cover EAS really quickly, EAS, espionage as a service, is a situation where an attacker goes in and sits there. They don't do anything, they don't steal any data, they don't you know, compromise your systems, they just exploit a vulnerability and set up shop. So basically they have some back doors to your systems and they set up a command and control center. They don't execute anything until they get actually what you would consider an RFP saying, hey, we'd like to get this information from such and such an organization. The hackers will see if that organization is part of their portfolio that they've penetrated and if so, they'll negotiate a price to deliver certain information. So there's a very strong chance that this could have happened to Anthem. We don't know if it has or hasn't but there's a chance that you may hear in the future of secondary attacks. And so that's always something to keep in mind if you come under attack that there's a very good chance that if you found one attack and you stop and you go, wow, we found it, we figured it out, we know what's going on, and you don't continue looking, there's a very good chance that you're still compromised. So it's a really key thing to keep in mind here. <clears throat> so what are the results of the breach? Well, we know 80 million records. We hear that they were highly detailed, they're very complete records. But what does that actually mean? Well, it means that the actual record was com comprised of a tremendous amount of information that allows us to piece together somebody's identity. But in this case, we were able to go beyond the identity and connect them to family members. More importantly, we were able to connect them to their <clears throat> employer, how long they've been employed, as well as the actual uh, business address, business email, and home addresses of the individuals that were compromised. Uh, some of it we don't know for sure if it was part of the record that was, um, was obtained, such as blood type and things like that, but we do have a good feeling that based on the information that was released in the press as well as some other evidence we've seen, that it was a very detailed record. <clears throat> now purely on the speculation of the records, there's been <laughs> evaluation put on each record of between $100 to $250, and there's been some reports of some 
really wild numbers of upwards of $1,000 per record to buy the records uh, on the black market. What's interesting is we haven't seen a transaction occur in terms of somebody actually buying the records. Now, maybe that's changed in the last several hours or a couple of days, but we actually haven't seen that transaction occur, and I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as well. Typically, if you're into just stealing this stuff, you're going to get it and set it up on the market or drip it out to the market, get your money, and continue to get as much money as you can before you feel that you need to shut down your operation before somebody finds out who you are. In this case, we haven't seen those steps occur. doesn't mean it will not occur. doesn't mean in a month or two we don't see things show up in the black market, but at this point we don't see these, we don't see these records floating out there yet, <clears throat> at least not, not in a very public way. There is a very real possibility that other data was compromised. We're not sure at this point. Again, it's an ongoing criminal investigation. The other side of this that most people don't think about is <clears throat> this also creates a very huge challenge for Anthem. They're a very large, second largest insurer, healthcare insurer uh, in the country. At this point, they have a massive forensic and cleansing operation. And I'm giving you that piece of the puzzle because if you get breached, you need to think about the amount of forensics and cleansing that you have to do. By cleansing, we mean possibly um, <clears throat> taking machines down to the bare metal and reinstalling everything, recreating user accounts, recreating passwords, uh, recreating internal procedures. So it's a, you don't know how deep it's gone, and therefore you may have to touch every machine or device within your environment to get back to a known state. Um, it's also a massive hardening operation at this point. You're trying to plug all the holes that you could have plugged before the breach, so there's just a lot of work there. This is not a place, this is not something you really want to be in the middle of, especially on the scale of Anthem. And lastly, <clears throat> careers are at risk. And again, this goes back to kind of, you know, getting arm in arm and acting as an industry, as the healthcare industry, and being supportive of things that Anthem's going through because the challenge right now is with, we see breaches of this size, people's careers are ending. Not just their jobs, but their entire careers. One thing I've been telling people lately as people have come up and talked to me is you can miss a few quarters financially, you can miss a few deliverables, and more than likely you might get slapped on the hand, but you're not going to lose your job. You have one major breach, there's a real good chance you're losing your career because nobody's going to hire you after you're associated with a major breach on your watch. Um, so again, we need to become an industry that's supportive of each other in these times, not one that's pointing at each other's weaknesses. <clears throat> so what's all this cost to, to Anthem or somebody that's breached? Well, on average, it's about $194 per record for remediation, meaning for the forensics, the hardening, the <clears throat> purchasing of uh, identity protection and identity monitoring for the people that were affected by the breach. Now, some of this is covered by insurance, but not a lot. And one thing to understand about insurance uh, for cybersecurity and breaches is that you have to demonstrate that you were doing everything you should have been doing. If the insurance investigators determine that you weren't, then the payout of what they cover is going to be vastly different than what you're hoping for. Regardless of how much is covered by insurance, I can assure you it's not the full amount to get you back whole. So if you want to do some math while we're chatting here amongst each other, here's some really quick math you can do. I haven't done it, but we're basically talking $194 times 80 million records. That's one really large number, <clears throat> and that's a good estimate of what this could end up costing Anthem. You can take the same thing and think about if you had a breach, what it would cost you. And it's a pretty staggering, staggering figure. So <clears throat> let's turn our attention now to possibly who did this. And we're going to take this layer by layer. I'm going to tell you as I tell you this, it's going to sound like a Tom Clancy novel. Um, it's, it's, you know, but it's not. Um, and I'm going to give you the pieces of evidence that go along with this so that you can kind of see how it all comes together. So there's a group named Deep Panda. They are commonly believed to be part of a larger Chinese intelligence group that's part of, the, of China. Um, it's possible that they operate on their own, they're an independent group, but a lot of evidence suggests that they're also known as Axiom, uh, the Shell Crew, or Group 72. A security organization by the name of CrowdStrike has created the name or attributed the name Deep Panda to them. Personally, my view from what I've seen and heard and been able to, to interact with is that Deep Panda is a subset of Axiom um, that is very specialized and very focused on certain targets. They're highly skilled and highly polished. 
This is not a set of hackers sitting around in the back room or a bunch of script kiddies who stumbled on an opening in Anthem and decided to go after them. Uh, and you'll see why I believe that in a few slides. They have very mature TTP, which is tactics, techniques, and practices or procedures. Um, they actually, the way they attack targets and go after them is very well thought out, very meticulous, and very patient, which are all attributes of a very well-run intelligence organization, what we would consider things like CIA, NSA, or DIA. We have, and there are copies, if you want to do the research, of Deep Panda's five-year attack plan. So they actually have a written five-year attack strategy, and within that plan they have earmarked certain industries. Healthcare is one of them. Another one is Department of Defense and some other areas. <clears throat> the important thing to understand about that is they've really thought through their attack profiles over a period of five years. So unless something changes or they change their name, more than likely we'll see these types of attacks continue. They may reshuffle the deck in terms of who's actually doing it, but there is a very strong plan behind how these attacks are formulated. They're not financially motivated. <clears throat> and this is why earlier I told you it's very important to keep in mind that we haven't seen transactions occur on the black market. We may see them. I believe if you do, it'll probably be to cause some confusion and doubt, but not their ultimate ultimatum as to why they took the data. <clears throat> a lot of common thinking right now is that this is part of a human intelligence gathering mission and that by grabbing healthcare records, which are actually quite rich, uh, they're able to create downstream compromise. So if we go back to understanding that Anthem employs, I'm <clears throat> sorry, not employees, but insurers, federal employees, and government contractors, and you now have their work addresses, how long they've been employed, the information on their children, their spouses, where they live, <clears throat> it becomes quite a rich set of records to have on potentially somebody that you may go into a conflict with. Now please understand that I'm not suggesting that China in some way, shape, or form is planning to go to war. These are intelligence operations. <clears throat> More than likely we do the same thing. We're just better at it and probably don't get caught. They happen to get caught. We happen to have evidence that links it back to Deep Panda. And so, you know, it's just part of ongoing intelligence gathering. So <clears throat> let's take another step forward. So we have this group, Deep Panda. <clears throat> And back in November 2014, um, CrowdStrike, the security organization that started researching what's going on, um, publishes a, um, <clears throat> a document and a snapshot <clears throat> of a framework that they found called Scanbox. Now, Scanbox is malware, and <clears throat> it's extremely intelligent. It can utilize different playloads and different plugins. It's executed in a web browser. Regardless of what web browser you're using, Chrome, Safari, Opera, Fox, choose it, IE. Um, and within it, it has several plugins. Now, I haven't had time to spend a lot of time on dissecting the Scanbox malware, but from what I understand, it's, it's quite interesting in that it understands where it's being hosted, which browser it's living in. Uh, it flies under the radar, so it can't be picked up by by antivirus or other things. I think at this point that's changing because the, the signatures are a little bit better known. Um, but as you can see by the list of plugins, there's a variety of plugins that I can support. And if you look at these plugins, you'll probably realize that many of your organizations use some of these products probably second by second, day in, day out. Now the second thing we found, and by the way, Scanbox is, is linked back to Deep Panda, and I'll show you that trace in a moment. The second thing we found was that Deep Panda may have also authored a product or a, a malware by the name of Their Use Speed. Now, <clears throat> this, this malware provides backdoor access, right? So it basically sets up a remote command and control channel, so it gets on your computers, your devices, and it then has a feature where it goes back out, takes a few hops across the internet, and then reconnects itself back to a command and control system. Once it connects back, we now have a channel into your systems where we can execute commands, continue to create exploitations, escalate our attacks, do attack pivots, wherever we need to, over a period of time. And the big thing to understand here is these types of attacks are done over a period of time. It's not like the movies. We don't do th things over a period of an hour or a day. This is over a period of months. So <clears throat> I'm going to blow up this, this image for you 
so you, you kind of have a little bit better view of it. And so what, this is the <clears throat> this is the work that um, was published by CrowdStrike. And what you'll see here is the first thing is the scan box framework, which goes through a free servers, gets deposited in somebody's environment, and then you'll see the <clears throat> the Rust by um, malware that's now part and parcel of this trace. And what we're doing is walking through the internet at this point. So what you're seeing is just a trace that will eventually take us back to the originators, the authors. So this is how we can create attribution. And there's a whole science to attribution. Some people do it really well, some don't. But right now, a lot of people are speculating that this is, this is kind of how this thing unfolded. So one thing I want you to keep in the back of your mind is <clears throat> the Roost Beam utilizes this little key here is basically a certificate authority. It has a signed certificate. And that DTOP tools is the certificate signer. And just keep that in the back of your mind. And I'm asking you to kind of latch on to a few pieces of information, but you'll see how this all comes together. And what you'll see then is from here, <clears throat> we actually link all the way back to Deep Panda. Now, <clears throat> there's this little black box here that has no IP address published. And it's actually a very interesting kind of um, kind of situation that occurred. So I want you to take for a moment the understanding that you're part of Deep Panda and you're on an attack team. And for months, possibly a year, year and a half, you've been watching a target, in this case, Anthem. And you're waiting for a sentinel event to occur that allows you to launch an attack that can use the tools that you've built. Now, keep in mind that during that period of that year, you're building up intelligence. You're looking at the organization. You're reading financial reports. We're going on LinkedIn. We're seeing what job postings are occurring from Anthem. We start to learn that they're posting for Teradata positions. So we know they have a Teradata database system. We start thinking through, is there vulnerabilities on Teradata? Even if we can't find vulnerabilities, how do we gain, <clears throat> how do we run queries? How do we get data out of it? We start looking on other social platforms. We start looking for job postings in terms of what type of network infrastructure they have. Are they posting for jobs for Citrix or <clears throat> other, other tools? And we continue to add this to our intelligence gathering phase. And, and this is where there's a huge difference between your script kiddies and people that stumble into an attack and an organization that's operating much more like an intelligence agency than just a bunch of people out for it. In fact, it's even more, um, <clears throat> it's even more uh, indicative of somebody who's not a criminal, a cyber criminal, versus somebody who's a, an actual you know, attacker of, a, of a, possibly a nation state. So what happens? You walk into the office, somebody comes in and says, look, we've got the Sentinel event. We need to take a action right now. Well, <clears throat> that Sentinel event occurred in April 2014. In April 2014, and this takes us back to why we think the attack occurred or started then, <clears throat> somebody registered a website, we11point.com. Now, <clears throat> that may not have a lot of meaning for a lot of people, but if you've been watching this target for a good period of time, and you would have had to be watching the target for a good period of time to understand that you just now had a sentinel event and immediately strike and register a domain name. This is what occurred. <clears throat> we11point.com actually translates to wellpoint.com. If you right now, wherever you are, go to wellpoint.com, you'll be redirected, oops, let me do this, into, to a page that looks like this. Anthem, Wellpoint changed this name to Anthem. And what we see here <clears throat> is the DNS record entries that occurred. Now, if you look at <clears throat> line five, you'll see the date that it was occurred. And on the right-hand side, you're going to see that about eight to nine minutes later, there was a change to that domain record. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see the original registration that was done through GoDaddy. If you go down to line 17, you'll see the registrant's name. And if you follow lines 19 through 24, you'll see the registration occurred out of China. Within a few minutes, on the corresponding right-hand side of the page, you'll see that somebody went in and changed that record. Now, the only person that can change it, unless it was attacked, but it's unlikely that within eight or nine minutes it got attacked, to a fictitious address in the Cayman Islands. So when I told you this is like a big Tom Clancy novel, it is very much like a Tom Clancy novel. Unfortunately, it's very real. Now, what occurred is, <clears throat> over the next 
few hours to days, there were more domains that were registered. Now, the only way that this works is if you really understand your target. You would have needed to know that, wow, these guys changed their name, and when that changes, there's going to be certain behavior that employees and customers are going to take, and we can capitalize on that. And so what happened is <clears throat> the attackers went out and also registered several other domains, one of which is myhr, we11.com, hrsolutions.we11.com, and I purposely wrote it as well point so that you can see that it's easy to trip up between the two. You guys know as well as I do that most of your employees would never, ever double check the domain name in their browser address bar and would probably just click and <clears throat> they would be redirected to a compromised site. And when that occurs, you're going to start doing what? Compromising their browsers, gathering data, and eventually depositing your tools into their environments and their systems. And if you're patient, you're eventually going to have a command and control session that links back to your system, and you're able to start your attack escalations and attack points. So when you start hearing that certain users' accounts were compromised at, at, at Anthem, this is right now what the evidence shows as possibly what occurred, that at somewhere along the line, there was a phishing attack, the employees' accounts were compromised, the tools developed by Deep Panda were deposited on the machines of the employees, then you threw in remote command and control, the machines were comp <clears throat> the attack escalated to where they had administrative privileges over the databases. Now, they also, <clears throat> and this is where it goes back to that intelligence, and I really want you to understand these are not unsophisticated people doing these attacks. They also registered, as you can see in yellow, extcitrix.we11point.com. Now, <clears throat> why is that important? We'll talk about that in a moment. First, I just want you to understand that I want to give credit where credit's due. This, this, all of this DNS work, looking at the historical DNS records, was done by a guy named Richard Barger from Threat Connect. He was the principal investigator. That's an amazingly cool find, an amazingly cool piece of, the, of forensic work that he did, and even more so that he shared it with the community at large so that other people can understand the sophistication behind the attacks. So that domain actually um, was used, we believe, to mask access uh, for employees using Citrix remotely or supply chain um, partners. <clears throat> They're using the VPN service and by using the tools that they developed earlier, the, uh, the Rusty tool that we talked about, and as you can see, there's a certificate by Detops Tools that we looked at earlier, which was actually, we believe, used to compromise the uh, Citrix sessions and create a trusted account or trusted exchange. Um, and we, we're not going to go deeper into that offline or if you want to reach out to me as to the mechanics behind that. But the bottom line is <clears throat> that the Citrix systems, we believe, may have been compromised um, using some form of malware that allowed people to go through the VPN session. And this also possibly compromised the supply partners that in this case would be DOD or small to large businesses or things of that nature. Again. I want you to also keep in mind that this is on the evidence we know, and it could be a vastly different story if you were part of the Department of Justice investigation team. One thing I want to talk about <clears throat> real briefly is I often get asked questions on encryption. Um, so, you know, isn't VPN encrypted? And, you know, so how could they have seen the data? Well, keep in mind at this point, they're, they're on the system as a validated user. You know, the, the encryption is meant to block people that don't have valid access. So at this point, you're going to see everything as if you were anybody else that has access to that information. So VPN is extremely important. You should use it. But you need to understand that in this level of a compromise, um, you're working within the confines and, and the design of the system. So VPN and, and, and encryption is not going to help you. <clears throat> and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. One thing that Anthem has done is an amazing job of cooperating with people. <clears throat> So they sent high trust the um, <clears throat> indicators of compromise, basically all the forensic data, and high trust sent out um, requests to various organizations saying, "Have you seen these IOCs, these indicators of compromise?" And people came back and said, "No, we really haven't seen these." So at that point, it was declared or thought by high trust that you know what, this is a very specific attack against Anthem. This is not 
just a, you know, kind of people throwing stuff out and going across the internet and seeing how many organizations they can attack. And again, this brings us back to the concept that there was probably a very focused intelligence operation against this specific target, in this case Anthem. We do have some evidence that hasn't been confirmed yet <clears throat> that uh, an organization in Reston, Virginia, that's a DOD contractor, was also compromised using the same type of attacks. If that turns out to be true, it would then further validate that five-year attack plan that we've seen from Deep Panda that ties back up to the Axiom group. We don't know if Anthem was a pivot point for this attack, meaning did they compromise Anthem and then use either the Citrix sessions or some other means to compromise this other DOD contractor. Um, but at this point, what we're seeing based on the high trust information is that this was a very specific attack against a specific organization. So how did they discover it? <clears throat> this was discovered in, inadvertently. Um, as many of you may already know, an IT member <clears throat> um, noticed that somebody else was logged in while they were logged in using their account. This caused them to kind of start thinking like, wait, what's going on? Um, they you know, did the typical things of trying to trace the IP. Over a period of a day or two, they realized that data was being taken. Uh, and then they did the right thing, immediately notified authorities, went public, and did all the, the things that you should be doing in these situations. But I want you to take away one thing here, right, because we often miss this, is this technology didn't detect the attack of human that detected it. And if there's one huge vulnerability in our systems, it's the humans. And in this case, we got really, really lucky. Because if this one individual wouldn't have seen it, wouldn't have known what they were looking at, would have just thought it was an anomaly, would have been more interested in going to lunch, then the Anthem attack we wouldn't even know about and the compromise would be continuing. It's not like the attackers decided, hey, we're done, let's go home. It's, hey, we're still here, let's see how further we can go. Now, this isn't to poo-poo over technology and say that there's not a place for it. But I think sometimes, all too often, we put way too much trust in the technical systems that we have in place. And we feel warm and fuzzy if we don't get any alerts and we don't get any compromises showing up or our logs aren't telling us anything. And um, <clears throat> it's just a really dangerous practice. And in this case, it kind of bears out that despite all the investments that Anthem made, it came down to the right one person doing their job, being trained properly, and spotting an anomaly that they didn't just leave as an anomaly, but brought up and did something about. <clears throat> so, are you next? Things to consider, things to do. This is probably going to be the most politically incorrect part of this discussion, and then we'll get into some Q&A. But um, <clears throat> one thing is to really think about if you're already compromised. And if you, you know, a lot of people, and you should be investing in pen testing, vulnerability assessment, but you should also try and invest in, if possible, a discovery of, is there something already in your system? Because what we've seen from things like the Target breaches, the Sands Casinos, Anthem, is that some of these things go on for months, possibly years, and then all of a sudden there's a stumbling on something and we find out that you've been compromised. Um, you know, so one thing to consider is, are you compromised? If you really don't know that you are or not, then find, find a solution to figuring out if you can, can figure out if you're compromised. Supply chain <clears throat> has become one of the weakest links in security. You may have a very tight shop, but especially in the world of HIPAA, with covered entities and the responsibility you have for patient data, data as it traverses the chain of, of covered of business associates, you need to really think about, is your supply chain weak? In this case, we're not sure if the supply chain was compromised or not for the Anthem. In the target situation, we know that the supply chain was compromised. One of the key concerns right now in the industry, in the cybersecurity industry across sectors, healthcare, finance, retail, critical infrastructure, is the supply chain. If you're really not establishing a, a level of service and security quality with your partners, whether they're business associates, or just the people <clears throat> that um, come to service the copiers, you may have a real big hole in your security uh, planning. <clears throat> Are you politically correct and proper? Way too often when I meet with people, there's just 
so concerned about being politically correct in terms of their cybersecurity strategy, not offending somebody in the organization, not upsetting the users, not making it hard. And that's fine <clears throat> if, you, you know, if you're going to own that and take responsibility for the risk. But really consider how politically correct are you being versus how secure. Because they are all odds. It's very hard to be politically correct um, and, and still be extremely secure. And there's obviously a balance there in terms of usability versus cost versus risk. It's something you need to work out and think what's right, but at least think about it. <clears throat> um, one area that constantly comes up is the board or the suite not truly understanding the threats and risks. One of my hopes is that with this presentation, you can take things out of here, go to your boards, go to your C-suites, and be able to discuss with them and kind of give them the background and show them the sophistication of the attacks so they kind of hopefully become your ally in what you're trying to do and really kind of wake up and go, wow, I didn't realize this is how sophisticated it is. Most C-suite and board members that I speak to often think that, oh, it's a hacker, it's, it's some script kitty, it's a bunch of college kids, you know, some guys in Russia looking for credit cards. You really don't understand the sophistication levels uh, and the challenges that, that you as the core part of the industry trying to deal with this problem face. So <clears throat> hopefully part of this presentation will help you deal with that. Incident response plans, um, you know, especially part of the HIPAA assessments, but they're not really tested. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment uh, or continually updated. So you have a bunch of new intelligence, hopefully, that's coming out of this presentation. You should be going back to your incident response and thinking about, you know, what would we do if this was us? One way to test this, if you really want to get down to brass tacks and think about, or would you, you know, how good is your cybersecurity policy and strategy and systems, um, is just to ask yourself, would you email Deep Panda if I could give you an email form and dare them to come after you? And if the answer to that is no or I'm not sure, then you probably have work to do on your cybersecurity strategy. And that's not meant as a criticism. It's really and truly meant as a passionate plea for this industry to kind of get serious about cybersecurity. And I do realize there's economic challenges, priorities in terms of projects. You know, I, I really understand that, whether it's on the vendor side, provider, payer side, uh, or any of the constituents in between. But at some point, you have to realize that, you know, the problem's not going away. So what are some things you can do? One is massive education. It's probably the cheapest thing you can do, but having a well-trained workforce Regardless of what area of this industry you're in, if you're a vendor, then you need to have your engineers, architects, and product managers understand cybersecurity because your products are, continue, are contributing to the challenges that the providers and payers are having to deal with. If you're a provider payer, then educate your workforce. Think about <clears throat> ways to help them understand why a certain should be put in place and to kind of be a little bit aware. Realize the day-to-day -day grind gets to everybody. But it's important that they at least get a fighting chance to understand that there's real steps they can take to not, to not allow your organization to be compromised. So again, it's cheap, it's very effective, and the human element is often understated in terms of fighting back on cybersecurity. Risk management versus perimeter defense. <clears throat> I have very mixed feelings in this. Um, I believe highly in risk management. And I'll tell you the difference in a moment, but I also feel that it's creating a defeatist attitude. And what by that I mean is when you start hearing people talk about, well, we should focus on risk management, they usually will say something like, well, you know people are going to get in. There's nothing you can do to stop them. And that's, frankly, just a lot of crap. <clears throat> you may not want to invest at the levels that you need to to stop people from breaking into an organization. And that may very well be impossible for some people to afford. But do not believe in the myth that if you don't want people to get in, you're going to not allow them in. Risk management is all about <clears throat> focusing your attention on the most critical areas of your organization. So if that's the medical data, uh, if that's your security infrastructure, if that's your auditing systems, whatever it is, if that's your employee data, if that's your biomedical devices, whatever you think is the most important, really focus on locking that down. That doesn't mean you abdicate perimeter defenses but it really does mean that you really think about locking down the most risk or most high value targets within your organization. That's an entire presentation in and of itself, but the thing I'd love you to take away is it's a very viable strategy, but don't give up or don't give in to the myth that they're going to get to it anyway. That's just not a real good way to be 
to be going through uh, through your day to day. That's at least in this industry with the lives that we have at stake. <clears throat> One thing I see is uh, this kind of goes back to the politically correct thing. If you're going to do pen testing and vulnerability assessment and security audits, and get somebody that's going to tell you the truth, and that's not going to be politically correct, and it's going to be a little rebellious. Um, and whoever that is, whoever you decide to work with, or however you do it, demand of them that they hold you accountable for really truly understanding what's going on in your environment, with your people, and with your policy, practices and policies. Um, when you start getting checkmark vulnerability assessments where you know the same thing that was done for another organization is done for you, and you know it's the same methodology that's been used for the last two or three years, and frankly, <coughs> you're um, you're, you're, you're just check marking. Um, test often and test realistically and ruthlessly. Um, two other things I don't think I put it in here um, <clears throat> is continuous monitoring and continuous attack. One of the big things we're seeing is a shift to risk management, like I said, continuing that investment in perimeter defense. But continuous monitoring of your environment is really, really critical, as well as continuous attack. If you're going to, you should be, if you're going to be doing pen testing and vulnerability assessment, do please do not do the come in, test me, and let's sit down, see what you found, and then come back next year. You get involved with organizations that aren't going to tell you when they're going to attack you. They're not telling you how. Be really realistic about your rules of engagement and be in a position where they're continually trying to get to you because, frankly, that's what the organizations that are really coming after you are doing. You know, if we look at the deep panda attack methodology, they're not just coming in, spending a couple of weeks, and then going away. You know, they're taking months and months and months to build up an attack. So think about how you can test often realistically and ruthlessly. Um, <clears throat> focus on the supply chain. We talked about that. It's they're the weakest link. So go figure out where your compromise is there, what tools you can use to, to assess the, uh, the strength or weakness of your supply chain. One thing that is a real easy thing to do is a cybersecurity SLA both with your vendors, if you're on the provider payer side, and with your own systems and how you manage and operate them across the spectrum of healthcare. Um, just say, hey, this is, this is the level of readiness and the level of security posture that we want. Um, and obviously, there's a cost to that. But um, you know, it's something that I think that if you craft, it, it would be a really smart thing to do and to be able to measure your ability to maintain that SLA. And then take a holistic view. One of the things I do find is a challenge within the healthcare industry, regardless of the constituents that, that I interact with, is that we typically tend to think about the common things, web servers, firewalls, intrusion detection, EMRs, databases. This is a big industry. And one takeaway I'll give you in terms of taking a holistic view is anything with a computer chip can be compromised. And so there's a lot of computer chips and a lot of computer technologies in our industry from handheld devices to bedside monitors. And if you don't think people are thinking about how to compromise those things, you, you really, you know, we should have a chat because that's it's not the reality of what's in, in, in the dark side of the world. So <clears throat> why all this matters? Because we really got to pray and hope that we don't go from a statement in a newspaper that says, hey, this was the largest loss of patient data in history to this is the largest loss of patient lives. Personally, I believe that will happen at some point. It's going to be unfortunate. I really hope it's not a huge, broad attack. But we have a lot of bad people out in the world. And unfortunately, they, they stay up day and night trying to figure out how to create damage within the borders of our country. So <clears throat> with that, I want to thank you. I'm hopeful that at least at a really tiny, tiny level, I've done something to give you something to think about. You can take something away from this, regardless of your position in the organization or the type of organization you represent. Um, you know, I think I addressed this earlier, but if not, I'll say, you know, I, I, again, I keep getting asked, is, is, is Anthem a change? You know, is this a change point? You know, when, when we talked with the HIS talk team and said, hey, we should do a Q&A about Anthem, you know, we, we did that on Monday. And it was, you know, the word was put out, wasn't a lot of marketing done to this, and we had a tremendous response. There's a tremendous amount of people listening to this. So I think Anthem has sparked a decide, or, you know, sparked an initiative to change this industry in terms of cybersecurity. But it's in your hands. My hope is that you guys drive this forward and really start thinking about how you can lock down and harden your environments in practical, cost-effective ways. Um, with that, there's some resources. 
I'm, I'm going to go over these quickly so we get the Q&A because I promise not to sell you on anything. There's a conference at the end of March that, that I and my team are sponsoring, and, and it's uh, Hacking Healthcare. You can go out to the website. We've tried to make it as cost effective as we possibly can. You know, it will continue to, to share the information we've gotten here, but one unique aspect of that conference is you will walk away with a 2015 cybersecurity plan based on the latest intelligence tactics and techniques that we know. Um, if you want to talk to us further, you can reach out to us. You can reach out to Divergent. Um, and if you want an actual copy of these slides, um, you'll feel free to email us. And um, you know, I'm sure Lori will be sending you out PDF copies of the slides to everybody that's registered and, and attending the conference. So with that, Lori, if we want to open it up to Q&A, that, that'd be awesome. Great. Thanks, John. Um, as he said, now we'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. As a reminder, you can use the questions section on the GoToWebinar panel to submit your questions to John. Um, the first question, John, uh, was the Anthem data encrypted and what are your thoughts on data encryption? So um, I don't know if it was encrypted or not for sure. There's been a lot of people in the press saying, well, it should have been encrypted and if they would have been encrypted and had the same standards as HIPAA and blah, blah, blah. And which is a lot of nonsense because if you understand the attack, well, let me step back. Should your data be encrypted? Yes. Data at rest should be encrypted. If it's not encrypted, shame. But this attack, even if the data was encrypted, would not have made a difference. <clears throat> and the reason for that is, you know, they logged in as a database administrator. So they had full access to the data in its native state because they were authenticated. And they were authenticated as part of the encryption standard. So, um, yeah, should stuff be encrypted? For sure. Um, but will it will it save you in this type of attack? No. Okay. Um, Jason would like to know what controls what you would include in the security SLA that you referenced. <clears throat> um, you know, that's a good question. I think <clears throat> the SLA at least, you know, on a bare minimum should think through your vendor's position on security. So if you're dealing with or assuming you're a your provider payer or hospital organization. Um, at least, you know, a, a level of standard for your vendors in terms of how they're approaching security and the development and architecture of their products. Um, I would have SLAs in terms of some of the common things, password length, which is really hard because short, you know, complex passwords that are short are not really all that effective, so you need long passwords. So some of your policies. I would also, in an SLA, um, have things in how often are you going to be tested, you know, externally. Um, you know, how often are you going to look at if you've possibly been compromised? Um, so, you know, the earlier slide where we had the things on the left to consider, I would try to translate some of those things into um, kind of ongoing policy or procedures that are part of that SLA. Uh, if that if that answer is not deep enough for you, then feel free to email me, and I can I'd be happy to share with you more ideas on that. Okay, thanks. Um, Kevin would like to know why the medical data is worth $150 a record. Who would buy it and what would they do with it? Um, so, yeah, medical records, if you had, you know, um, so if you actually had diagnostic codes that said so-and-so had this disease, um, the data becomes much, much more credible because you can start making false insurance claims. Um, and so it becomes much more, you know, effective in that manner. If you're a nation state or you're someone else, some other form of criminal, uh, depending on what that diagnostic code is, so if I have 80 million records and let's assume, you know, not to talk off color, but let's say some population of that 80 million has uh, is being treated for STDs or erectile dysfunction. Um, and you don't want people to know that, you know, especially maybe your family members uh, or your, or your, your coworkers. Um, and you start being asked to pay ransom or that information is going to be released. You know, the, the, and this goes back to that rational response syndrome that I talked about earlier. One of the big things, which is a, this is a great thing, most people are not evil. They don't think about the bad things people will do with things of that nature. So those are some examples. There are others, but it's really that um, you now have a lot more leverage over the individual and you have the ability to transact uh, fraudulent claims. J.K. would like to know um, if you know if Anthem had an IDS in place, and if so, what your thoughts are on the thoroughness of IDSs and the dependence on them. Um, I'm assuming they would just because of the size that they are. 
<clears throat> um, you know, it's possible they didn't. I don't know if they did have one, if this attack would have would have been detected by the IDS um, just because of a combination of factors and the way they carried out the attack. Um, typically, an IDS is looking for an anomaly, and, and, and unless you know what anomalies to look for, meaning that you've already had to have the attack take place and you, you're going to pattern your future detections off of it, uh, it's not going to detect it. That said, you know, I think it's part of a foundational approach that you should have an IDS. I mean, it, you know, if there's 50,000 attacks out there and the IDS knows of 45,000 of them, then hopefully those 45,000 you don't have to worry about. Um, still leaves 5,000 that you don't know about, but that's a much smaller number than 45,000. So I would, I would, you know, I'd vote yes on the IDS. Okay. Um, do you know if Anthem had any MFA on Citrix? I don't. Um, it's a good question. I don't, yeah, I just don't know. Okay. Um, Sean would like to know if the two-factor authentication was bypassed in this attack. Um, I don't. I don't know if it was bypassed because I don't know if Anthem did or didn't have it. Um, I would tell you it depends on the. You know, when we talk about two-factor, there's a variety of things that you need to think about. <clears throat> One of those is um, if the two-factor is part of the OS, meaning like a biometric, you know, fingerprint as part of the laptop. Um, there's ways to compromise that, so it's not not the best thing. If you can have an external authentication factor like a swipe card or something of that nature, it makes it much better. It doesn't make it foolproof. As soon as you've attached to the device, you, you know, and, and if I own the kernel or I've installed a rootkit, then you know, I kind of have low-level access to everything going on. But I will tell you that I'm a firm believer that two-factor makes it much, much harder for people to do things. Just if you're going to do two-factor, really think about how an attacker would compromise two-factor and, and don't just assume that because somebody tells you it's two-factor that it's, it's really secure, but it's a great step in the right direction. All right. Um, this looks like our last question and we're running out of time. Um, as an industry, what can we do? We spend a ton of money on cybersecurity, but it really doesn't seem like it does any good. Um, yeah, you know, it, it, I think the first thing is doing forums like this. You know, I think the more times we can as a community get together and really talk about things and share information. You know, earlier I mentioned the fact that attacker, you know, hackers and attackers, and I kind of categorize them differently, um, share information. They share tools. They share, you know, techniques, processes, who's been attacked, uh, who's vulnerable, who's not. There's entire websites where you can go to and look at every IP address that's been attacked across the globe. Um, we need to do that on our side. Right? We need to kind of say, hey, you know, here's what I'm seeing. You know, this is what I just saw. I saw this anomaly. You know, here's how I dealt with this. This is the IDS I'm using. We really need to start talking. That's a big deal. And the second thing is kind of put aside the political correctness. You know, if you're going to you're going to bring somebody in to do an audit or assessment or a vulnerability or pen test, you know, don't don't start throwing all kinds of rules and engagements in play that, you know, suddenly you're not really getting a real evaluation of your organization. And so I think those two things, you know, put aside the political correctness and and start working as a community all focused on the same thing. Those two things would go a long way to, uh, to harden the community or the industry overall. Okay. Um, Steve just stuck in a last question. Um, he said the attack began in a web browser and most applications require a web browser. Which ones are the most secure in your opinion? Ooh. You know, um, I, don't, I don't know. If, that's a hard question because you know, I could say like, well, you know, stay away from IE or whatever the popular answer is these days. You know, what I would tell you is that the way this attack occurred, it was really more about the users not understanding what was happening to them versus the web browser technology. The way that um, Scanbox works is it'll work across any browser and it'll do an auto detect on the browser and adjust itself for that browser. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, I hear a lot of people, I'll take this one step further, and then I know we run out of time, but if you take one step further, I hear like, well, Windows is insecure, Linux isn't, or Mac isn't, and the reality is, you know, there's just more people focused on breaking Windows products. It's not that Windows is inherently much different than Linux or, or Mac. When you're looking at it from my perspective as an attacker, you know, I'm sure there's people on the other side of the fence that have their debates, but as an attacker, as somebody who's looking to do evil, you know, it's just bits and bytes at the end of the day. And really what it comes down to is your policies and your people. 
And, and if you can get those right, then you're going to make my life a lot harder or, you know, somebody who's looking to do evil. All right, thanks. Um, that was our last question, so we'll be able to conclude the webinar. I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and thank you, John, for a very interesting and informative presentation. Uh, to the attendees, watch your email for links to the recording of today's webinar, as well as a PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. And don't forget, John will be presenting another webinar next week called Cloud Computing, Cybersecurity Considerations. If you're interested in attending that, you can find the registration link on HIS Talk, or you can just email me and I'll send it to you. We look forward to seeing you at our next HIS Talk webinar. Have a great weekend.